here. So welcome everyone. Thank you all for coming back. Good to see some familiar faces as <laughs> usual. I think I see a few new people that I don't know, but welcome. Um, so tonight we have, as Seth said, the amazing Lynn Griffin. She is a situate resident and an author, among other things, which I will let her tell you about. A um, couple of things. We want to thank the Mass Cultural Council for um, a grant, which helps us bring these programs to you via Zoom. Our next Zoom presentation will be on March 24th. We've got a woman, her name is Carol Crost. She actually purchased the um, Susan B. Anthony birthplace in Adams, Massachusetts. Um, I forget which year it was. And she turned it into a historical museum. She's gonna be joining us with a presentation called, I'm sorry, my cat is in the middle of the screen here, which is called Vintage Tweets. And it is, um, she has a collection of postcards from the suffragist movement. So she will be with us on the 24th. Um, as always, these programs are free to the public. Anyone is welcome to join. We gladly do accept and appreciate any donations. They can be sent to the society um, by mail or by PayPal, which you'll find on our Facebook page. And um, I think that's it. I think we'll, we'll get this started because I'm very excited to hear all about the dangers of an ordinary night. Lynn? Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you tonight about a number of different inspirations for my latest novel, which is called The Dangers of an Ordinary Night. And um, I'll, I'll give you a little background. I'm going to share a little bit of my inspiration, and then I'll read a little bit from the story to give you that situate vibe. And then I would love if you asked questions, both about my research on the issues that I delve into in the story, uh, or also anything related to my long and winding crazy career, which I'm gonna tell you a little bit about, and also about writing, because some of you may be writers. So, um, you know, what I decided to do for uh, a living when I, when I was back deciding about going to college is um, I went to school to become a registered nurse. So I've been a registered nurse for a number of years. I went on to get advanced degrees in education and counseling, and for many years um, have been a family counselor with a private practice here in Situate and occasionally uh, offices in, on the South Shore, uh, Norwell, Cohasset, and so on. Uh, so my background is in psychology and family counseling. Uh, but at a turning point in my life, I decided that I needed a creative endeavor. I needed a creative outlet. And I began writing fiction for myself. It was a creative process of storytelling that I engaged in really for my own enjoyment. Uh, and one thing led to another. And my uh, first novel, Life Without Summer, was published in 2009. And since then, uh, Dangers of an Ordinary Night is my fourth. And I have another one coming, another novel coming out next year. And I'll tell you more about the, each of those um, later on. But there's something that, oh, I always knew that I would write about Situate. I didn't know which story would have Situate as a location, uh, but I knew that I would need to write about it at some point because for any of you who do live in Situate or have visited Situate, uh, you know that it's just a magical landscape and that seasonally uh, it, is, it changes quite a bit and it has its own atmosphere and vibe to it. And so, as a writer, as someone who enjoys the creative pursuit, uh, I knew it would land in a story someday. I didn't know which one, um, but I'm gonna tell you my inspirations and how that collides for someone like me, for someone who is a fiction writer uh, and how stories really come together. They don't come fully formed. They come in fragments until they collide into something uh, that starts to take off. So I'm going to share a few slides with you and talk to you a little bit about those inspirations. So um, the, the photo of the book is there, The Dangers of an Ordinary Night. I'm happy toward the end of the presentation to tell you a little bit about, about the creative process and how, how covers 
are designed. It was my original intent that there would be a picture of Situate on that cover, um, but it's not always completely up to the author. Uh, the story also takes place in Boston, so it has two locales, two major locales, Boston and Situate. And so the artist and the publicity team went with a picture of the Back Bay, which is where one of the locations is. Um, the picture in the middle is Situate Harbor, and I took that photo myself. I am um, more of a writer than a photographer, but I'm pretty proud of that one because it's so beautiful. <laughs> and then the other picture that you see there is the Exeter Street, the former Exeter Street Theater in Boston, in the Back Bay on Newbury Street, the corner of Newbury and Exeter. It is now a school called the Kingsley School, uh, but it, for many years it was the Exeter Street Theater. And before that, it was a gathering place for the transcendentalists. Uh, so it has a very long and storied history. When I talk about experience as an inspiration, I'm talking about the idea that as a writer, for me, my stories come at me in those fragments. They come at me in little bits and pieces. And just as I knew that Situate would always factor into a story at some point, I also knew that the theater would. Um, that first photograph is actually me in a play uh, when I was in college, uh, a little bit younger me, uh, but I was an actress in high school, college and beyond for a number of years. And it was really my passion. I felt that I would have a career in the theater. Um, but that was not to be because when I was trying to factor in my next steps, uh, I was told that that wasn't a practical path and that I needed to do something more practical. So I abandoned that idea of going, uh, but it was much to my dismay. Uh, it, it always felt like there was a part of me that was intended to go the route of, of an actress as a theater, as a theater person. Uh, and so it's always stayed with me. So again, that experience as inspiration was coming forward a lot to me when I began thinking about what I would write next. So I had theater in my mind. Um, you're also seeing a picture there of my private practice office, which is where I see parents and work with adults on helping vulnerable children to contend with learning challenges. So I've been a, a family counselor for a number of years and I counsel families on how to handle some of the more contemporary issues of family life. So that inspiration is always part of my work. I listen to families on a day-to-day -day basis and they're always telling me their stories and I'm always influenced why, by what's on their mind. I'm always influenced by the struggles and the themes I hear about the kinds of things that are influencing families. Um, the lower picture is a picture of me doing some public speaking. I also do a lot of work with schools, helping schools to support vulnerable children and in particular schools dealing with the social and emotional learning and preventive mental health of, of our most vulnerable kids. Um, and so I'm always, again, inspired by what I'm hearing from schools. And then finally, a number of years ago, I watched an HBO documentary called Heroin Cape Cod USA. And it is a very powerful dramatic piece that was, um, a group of mothers and fathers sharing the impact of addiction on their families. So when their children were struggling, what impact it had on them as parents and what impact it had on them as a couple, as in their marriages and even in their own lives separately of their families, um, their own identity formation. And so again, all of these inspirations, all of these experiences are coming together until I started to realize that they all went together. And then to top it all off, the acting inspiration, the family counseling inspiration, the vulnerable children inspiration, and the HBO documentary on addiction and the impact on families suddenly collided and I knew I had a story. So again, imagine these fragments all separate and then somehow coming together and gelling into a story. So I suddenly knew that for the dangers of an ordinary night, I would be placing a family in a situation where their vulnerable child 
was in a performing arts high school where the pressure was intense and where the factors in the family would bring to bear a crisis. And in this family, the wife and the daughter are impacted by the addiction of the father. And I knew I had my story, right? But then I thought, okay, I've got my story, but where is all of this happening? And so experiences are inspiration, but also place is an inspiration. And I have always loved this quote by Robert Louis Stevenson, in which he says, some places speak distinctly. Certain dank gardens cry out for murder. Certain old houses demand to be haunted. Certain coasts are set apart for shipwrecks. And I love that quote because basically what it's saying is there are certain atmospheres that lend themselves to storytelling. And that's when I knew I was going to be placing it in situate. That's when I knew that the story that I had and all the pieces were coming together for me, I also knew that there could be a crime that takes place in my beloved town, in a part of the town that is restricted to people who live, live here. And so that's how I started to get the idea that the crime and the solving of the crime would take place in the glades. So one of the things that I began to do before I started writing was I started doing research. And I was fortunate enough to be able to go to the Situate Library and use some of their materials there. And I also was um, delighted with the Situate Historical Society bookstore, the schoolhouse, where I was able to tap into beautiful resources like the Glades book that I'm showing here. Um, this is a beautiful book that gives you some of the history of the Glades and the Glades Association. Um, but also in Situate Library, there were you know, numbers of other accounts of what it was like to live there, what was the history of the landscape. Um, and I just found it really fascinating. I felt like there was just the very fact that one is not supposed to go out there, that, that it belongs to people, but it's not an open access part of our town. Uh, really intrigued me. And so I started to put all of those pieces together and I began to write. And so The Dangers of an Ordinary Night is a story that begins in the glades in Situate. Uh, two girls go missing after an audition for a play. And two days later, one of them is found dead and the other one is found alive. But she has no recollection of what happened because of the trauma of what happened that evening. They're both students at a performing arts high school in Boston. And it, as you can see in this picture below, that is the original Exeter Street Theater. That is an old photograph of the theater in its heyday. Um, the school that it is now looks more like the picture you see here. The Exeter Street Theater, uh, again, as I said to you before, is on Newbury Street and Exeter Street. And if you've been in Boston of late, you'll know that there is now a restaurant um, on the corner of that building. It's called Joe's American Bar and Grill. It used to be Fridays. Um, so maybe you understand or remember that landmark. And as I said, that building is now a school. And interestingly enough, I actually worked at that school for five years. I was the school counselor at the school and I was responsible for the emotional well being of children from age two to age 12. Um, so I have been in that building on a day-to-day -day basis doing my job. My office, you can, I could point out to you where my office was in that building uh, by looking at those windows. Uh, it is the place that inspired me to create a fictional performing arts high school. So in the dangers of an ordinary night, the two girls, Tally and June, go to school at the performing arts high school of Boston, which is actually this building here. And, um, and in the aftermath of June's death, Tally goes back to school and she goes right back into acting. She goes right back into the high pressure, high stakes world of performing arts. While her mother and a detective and the counselor that's helping her reacclimate to her family, try to figure out what exactly happened in the glades. Uh, 
um, the picture in the in the bottom corner of the uh, slide here is a picture that I took of mine at beach. And if you look super, super closely, you can see uh, mine at lighthouse in the background there. Um, this is another shot of the Exeter Street, former Exeter Street Theater, but now as the school. Uh, and as you can see, it's just a commanding, gorgeous building that, as Robert Louis Stevenson said, cried out for a story. Uh, this building really spoke to me uh, in needing some drama to happen there. This is another shot that I've taken. I, I walk in our town quite a bit. And this is another picture of, of low tide at mine it. And here's another with the changing weather. And again, as you can see, I spoke a moment ago about how seasonally um, you can tell that the sun is shining brightly here uh, based on the fact that somebody's about to go in the water. Uh, this is springtime summer. Whereas if you look here, we're looking at late fall. Um, I have so many pictures of Situate in different seasons because again, it gives off a different emotional energy, a different emotional vibe, uh, depending upon the time of year in which it's captured. I also had a lot of fun looking at vintage photographs and vintage uh, postcards. This is actually a vintage photograph of the Glades. Uh, so you can see it's just, it's another location, another landscape that's calling out for story. Here's a, a postcard of Well Rock in North Situate on Minot, which is, you know, I've never seen it with stairs. I have never, I haven't lived here long enough to see it with stairs, but perhaps some of you have seen it in this kind of, of fashion. Uh, but again, these, these landscapes really needed story where I was concerned. Um, also, I found these pictures um, from my research, which is the observation tower, which was uh, at one point an army observation tower, at another point a navy obser observation tower. So it belonged to the army and the navy at different times. And then there's one of these um, not completed uh, uh, buildings or um, potential observation towers. And in one account that I read, they were referred to as the cottages. And I believe there are a couple of them on the landscape. And these cottages and this observation tower factor into my story. So I did use real details to inform the plot. And then that's my final picture there. So I will um, stop sharing the screen uh, so that we can um, you know, talk a little bit about uh, the questions that you might have, but I thought I might read a little from the book uh, to give you a taste of how I took those inspirations and factored them into my story. I'll just share a little bit and then I'd love to hear from you. Questions, I, if any of you have history you want to share that touches on any of what I've talked about, I welcome you to share it because even though the book is finished, um, my fascination with this place is not finished and probably never will be. Uh, so I'd like to read a little bit of The Dangers of an Ordinary Night to you. This is a scene where the daughter Tally and her mother Nell are talking about how difficult it is that Tally can't remember the details, that she can only remember certain fragments of information. She can't remember the whole evening about being out there and how difficult that is for her. And so they're having a conversation about that difficulty of not really knowing everything that happened. And remember, Nell is her mother and she's trying to help her acclimate back into this life that she lives in the aftermath of uh, losing her friend. And um, these are the people, Nell and Tally are the people that are contending with the father's addiction. And, um, and Tally is an actress. She is the performing arts sort of star Right, and so that'll factor in uh, to this passage as well. So she says, she, Tally pauses for effect and she says, mom, I need to go back to the beach. In situate? Absolutely not, her mother says. I need to remember. I think if I can see the real place again, I'll dream about it less. You don't know how hard it is to not know. Nell knows exactly how it, hard it is not to know. 
Come on, Tally said, it's a sunny day. We can drive there and walk around just a little, that's all. What harm could it do? Despite her mother's objections and her insistence that they wait until the psychiatrist gives them the all clear, Tally is convincing. By noon, they're dressed and in the car, driving south on 93, heading for the seaside town her grandmother called the Irish Riviera. Nell hasn't traveled these roads for 10 years. The tiny cottage she inherited from her grandmother after she passed away was sold long ago to cover one of Zeke's more substantial gambling debts. But even before Nana Parker died, Nell had difficulty going back to visit. It was hard to go to a place she loved that she could no longer go. This time, the closer Nell gets, the tighter she grips the steering wheel. As she and Tally drive past one familiar landmark after another, it's harder for her to call up the nice memories. All she can think of is the night that some monster took her child. We could, we could go to the silent chef for takeout if you want, Nell says. I used to like to bring uh, lunch to the lighthouse. We could do that if you want, or we could get a table at the mill wharf, whatever you wanna do. Tally's silence cuts Nell. Maybe she's having second thoughts about doing this. For the entirety of the trip, she's done nothing more than stare out the window. Nell would give anything to be arguing over the volume of the music or which radio station to listen to. Her daughter doesn't talk until suddenly she does. The last thing I remember is being pushed in the car, Tally said. It was old and the back seat was crackling plastic. It smelled funny. Whenever Tally recounts the details of the abduction, however small they may be, Nell pretends to be calm. When inside, she's jangled like ice cubes being dropped in an empty glass. I wanna to go to the glades, Tally says. That's not a good idea. We really need to talk to Dr. Rollins. I don't think we should do this. I need to go to the glades, Tally says. Against her better judgment, Nell stops resisting. They've come this far. Tally will get her way eventually. Instead of heading toward the harbor shops and restaurants, Nell takes a left on Gannett Road. In minutes, the sea comes into view. It's high tide and the waves lap the seawall, erasing any evidence of a beach. Left turn again, they're on Glades Road. Tally taps the window. I can do this, go faster. Nell drives past the area known to locals as the hazards, an area of surf harboring rocks of every shape and size, some submerged, some visible. Every townie has a tall tale about bar rock or Smith rocks, all of them pale in comparison to the story Tally might someday be able to tell about Situate Neck. For a split second, Nell is pulled back to the night of the vigil, that horrible moment when the detective told her that a teenage girl had been found dead on the beach at the site of the Old Glades Hotel, the other girl alive but in rough shape. As if Tally has read her mother's mind, she reaches over to pat her arm. Through there, she says. The isolated peninsula of rocky ledges and salt marsh is a gated community that occupies the entire promontory. It's cut off from the rest of the town. Access to the glades is restricted. You're either invited in or you're trespassing. Undeterred, Nell gets out to lift the gate and then drives through the center of the point along a dirt road. The further in they go, the more heavily wooded the area becomes. Trees rise over thick tangles of brush and vine until they come to a break in the woods that offers glimpses of the sea. This is where her daughter gets out. We walked this way, Telly said. I had to go slow because my hands were tied and it was dark. Nell hurries to catch up with her to hear Tally above the surf. Somehow June got away. He chased us and I ran too. Tally sits down on a boulder. Her feet disappear into a mound of red orange leaves. She scans the ground with her hands and disturbs the vegetation, breathing deep through her nose. What are you looking for, Nell says. Tally snaps too, as if now only realizing that her mother is near. I'm putting myself in character the way I do when I need to act. Seconds later, she's up again, moving around to the sound of the sea. This way, we went this way. It takes Nell a second to register what Tally is doing cannot be good. She shouldn't have waited. She should have waited till the doctor called back. Nell sh never should have let her agree to bring her down here. Dread moves her forward, but Tally is a dancer, fit and fast. She disappears behind Pulpit's Rock, and when Nell finally catches up, rounding the boulder, she nearly crashes into her daughter. 
Tally's face is drained of color. Her eyes are glassy with tears and fixed on a bit of cloth. She doesn't conceal that she is shaken. The scrap of stark white fabric covered in multicolored polka dots clings to a branch. It's a piece of June's pretty raincoat. So that's a little bit of how I put my inspirations together using our beautiful town, this beautiful town of Situate uh, to create a story that is about family. It's about marriage, it's about parenting. It's about the high stakes pressure of being a kid these days, um, which I hear a lot about in my work as a family counselor. Uh, and it's really a vehicle for me to express my own creative pursuits, to, to take what I know about my work with families and to take what I deeply care about, which is my creative inspirations and to forge them into a story for uh, readers to enjoy. So that is The Dangers of an Ordinary Night, a little, a little snapshot of it. And at this time, I would love it if you asked questions. Um, I know some of you have already read it. So if you have any thoughts, anyone who has any comments about Situate history, uh, I would welcome a lovely discussion. Then the first thing I'd like to say is um, we were talking before the presentation and I just confirmed that the Situate Historical Society will be having a tour to the Glades this fall. Um, you'll be taken out to the Glades on a bus and then it will be a guided walking tour through the Glades. So if you follow our Facebook page and our website, come probably end of the summer, we'll start putting out information on it. I'm so excited about that. I can't wait for, for people to, to see it and experience it. Um, it's a very, very special place. So anybody have any questions, any comments, any? I see a few of you out there. I know know a lot of history about Situate. I bet. I'd love to hear from you. Emily, I knew. <laughs> Can you unmute yourself? Let me, um, there you go. Uh, speaking of those stairs at uh, Well Rock, yeah. I don't remember them being there when I used to swim there as a teenager back in the 50s. So they probably were built when it was a center for you know people to come from Boston. There were a lot of actors and actresses. They came down and stayed at guest houses and hotels and so forth and the mine at beach area. So I suspect that's when it was, those stairs were constructed. When they were taken down, I haven't got a clue, but they definitely were not there when I was a teenager. So. Isn't it cool though, to see the postcard though with it? Oh, I, I love looking at the old postcards. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Great. So that was my commentary. <laughs> have, you, have you been out to the glades in your time? Yes, I, I have. Um, I, the Historical Society a number of years ago had a tour out there and I went on that tour. So I have been out there, which was definitely exciting. We trespassed as teenagers, of course. <laughs> well, I would- I, I remember climbing up in the tower. <laughs> yeah, and I will tell you that you're not the only one that has trespassed out. Oh you. no, definitely we not. But we won't, we won't. We won't tell any tales out of school. Yeah. Oh, just look at the graffiti on that cottage. <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah. Yes, it's quite a place going out to the glades. Uh, I was out there with the society taking pictures uh, when we went out a couple of years ago. And uh, it was an all day project uh, of going out there. Yeah. It, uh, it's been quite a, quite a place it started out as a hotel and it was kind of a had a uh, unsavory uh starting <laughs> <laughs> kind of a, a boarding house <laughs> yes yes, yes. Well, at first at mine at, down there was at first was a, a summer place for um wealthy families including the adamses so they all bought shares in it and owned it and that's why it's so exclusive yeah. And I believe the stairs left in one of the storms, like the storm of 78, um, the old storm in 88, way back in the late 1800s. The, oh, the stairs. interesting. Yeah. Interesting. 
Yeah, you can still see the marks where the stairs were in the. Oh wow! I'm gonna go look. I never looked for that, but yes, that probably yeah. is true. You can probably see where they were. Mm -hmm. Well, the Brahmins decided that uh, it should be bought up and used for them, so they uh, they bought it and and used it. And uh, the Adams family is one of the families that owns it. The Salton Stalls were uh, all uh, well uh, uh, Boston people and uh, a lot of Irish too, uh, because uh, it is the Irish Riviera after all. <laughs> <laughs> and it is still a family association. So there are people that still own shares in it. And there yeah. are some, um, my understanding is that there are private spaces and common spaces. Yeah. And it's, um, it's, you know, it's much like a, um, a sort of a condominium-ish yeah. model. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, Charles Adams used to go down with his yacht. He was the president of Raytheon and a direct descendant of uh, John Quincy Adams. And in fact, he, in his older age, he looked like John Quincy Adams. And uh. he used to uh, go down there with his yacht and he'd have people come out to the yacht. He didn't actually go in and stay at the house, but he'd have come out and have parties on the yacht. Mm. <laughs> Lots of history. Any so other questions, thoughts? I'd actually like to say something. So Lynn and I met probably, it's got to be 20 years ago now, Lynn. Yep. When I was the um, president of the Cohasset Dramatic Club, and um, she had her two children actually did shows with us. And Lynn and her husband were huge, huge um, theater parents, and they were they were there all the time and they helped us all the time. And I didn't know about her and her college acting. So this kind of tells me why you were such a fabulous theater parent. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Um, but, not like, but not like Anna in the novel, who's not a very good theater parent. <laughs> there's, a, there's a character in the book that is sort of your classic stage mother and she uh -huh. is Hopefully not what I was for the job. No, you, you guys, you were always there to help with everything. And it was fun. And I'm trying to remember, and I can't, was it um, uh, Alice in Wonderland that we you first came into the club? Right. You know what? I can't remember what the first one was, but I remember that both of my children showed a fascination for music and for theater when they were really little. Mm -hmm. and um, And I was like, screaming on the inside because I really did not want my kids to be sports people. I wanted them to be theater people, <laughs> yep. but, I, but I didn't want to make them theater people. I wanted them to just want to be, and they were thankfully. Yes. Uh, and it turns out that um, both of them ended up going into music. My daughter is a, uh, a beautiful chorale singer in the Back Bay Chorale. And she is also a music teacher in Plymouth. Ken, oh, Ken nice kindergarten through fifth grade. And my son is, um, he plays practically every instrument you can imagine. And he's a sound engineer. So he went into um, sound engineering uh, and he's also in a band. So it's, um, it's just really cool for me that they found their artistic niche. Now, I told them much like my mother told me that they needed to find a way to make a living, right? Mm. But, but they didn't have to deny their art. They had to find a way to use their art to make a living. Whereas when I was a girl, I was told that I really needed to deny my art in favor of right. making a living. Uh, it was important to me to show my children that you could do both of those things. Um, and I found my way back to my creative niche by writing. Uh, writing fiction is, is absolutely everything to me. It's, it's, um, I love everything I do. But writing fiction and getting lost in stories is mm. really it for me. I love it. Now, Lynn, can you tell us a little bit about your other books that you've got out in the sure. upcoming book? Sure, sure. So my first novel is called Life Without Summer. And it's actually set in a fictional situation. So I didn't at the time feel ready to tackle the real place because I had never written a novel before. So I took situate Cohasset vibe and set my story there. It's a story of a mother who loses her child in an accident and she 
becomes compelled to find out what happened. And um, it's a bit of a mystery. And then my second novel, Sea Escape, is a mother-daughter story. And it's about a young woman who has great difficulty connecting with her mother. And so she searches her mother's belongings for her mother's scrapbooks and her mother's letters and ultimately finds out that the story of her mother's life actually pulls them closer together. So that's a mother-daughter story. In that novel, I actually used love letters that my father wrote to my mother. And I, and I was able to work those into the story. So there are letters in the novel that actually were written by my father and I took them verbatim. Um, so I, I had to change the story of the, the couple, but I used my father's words to tell the story and that was really meaningful to me. Nice. Um, my third novel is called Girl Sent Away. And that's about uh, a young woman who is uh, a teenager who has a great deal of difficulty coping with a family tragedy. And she ends up going, her father ends up putting her in an adolescent behavioral wilderness camp. And I don't know if you know about these, but it's sort of like your, it's not outward bound, which is much more regulated. It's much more about these, these Midwestern um, boot camps uh, for kids that are troubled. And her father puts her- Oh, I like that music. Yeah. And, um, what are you watching? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, what you watching? <laughs> and so her father, her father puts her there and then comes to realize that uh, hey, it's really unhealthy for her. So Girl Sent Away is about adolescent mental health and it's a father-daughter story. And then Dangers of an Ordinary Night is what we just talked about tonight. Okay. And then my novel that's coming out in November of this oh, year. Called, we've got one person who want to mute, maybe? Yeah. Who is singing? If you could <laughs> mute, mute yourself, please. Um, Thank you. So Dark Rivers to Cross is the new novel that's coming out in November. And Dark Rivers to Cross is set in the uh, deep woods of Northern Maine. It's set along the Penobscot River. Hmm. And the reason why I chose that landscape is because for the last 20 some odd years, uh, we spend our summer vacation for a couple of weeks in Maine each year and I love that landscape and that landscape uh, speaks to me. This story is actually about adoption and identity and if parents ever have the right to conceal uh, an adoption story from their children. If they mm. know what their children's adoption story is and they mm. choose not to tell it. Not to tell it. Um, so it's also a bit of a mystery. It's a bit of a fast paced kind of river ride and, um, and the landscape figures in really prominently. And that was a really fun one to write for that reason as well. I did a lot of research for that by reading Henry Thoreau's Maine Woods. Um, I, did a lot of, uh, I did a lot of research by looking up photographers who had captured Katahdin and the beginning mm -hmm. of the Appalachian Trail and mm -hmm. what that landscape, uh, you know, how harsh it can be, yeah. but also how beautiful. So that novel, again, it's it's really my sensibility as a novelist, but again, different inspirations. Well, in the case of adoption, it's uh, it's not a good thing to keep it from the children. Mm -hmm. uh, they should know, and they should later know who their parents were because it, uh, in the medical field, it, it can uh, cause all kinds of problems because of uh, heredity. Right, mm -hmm. right. And in this particular story, the mother grapples with telling them what the story is because mm. it's so traumatic. And so you can see her, you can see her desire not to hurt them further, but the absence of information is also hurtful. So, yeah. so it's, you know, Again, I like to wrestle with these issues that don't have straightforward answers. Like in mm -hmm. Dangers of an Ordinary Night, there's a, a, a young man who keeps a secret uh, because he actually feels like it's better for his family if he keeps the secret and it hurts only him than mm -hmm. if he reveals it and it hurts more people. 
Um, and so I like, I like struggling with these things because as a family counselor, I know there's no one right answer. Um, mm -hmm. you know, these relationships are complex and multifaceted and, you know, I believe people do the best they can with the information that they have. So I, I love exploring this in fiction so that people have an opportunity to wonder, mm -hmm. you know, what they might do given the circumstance. Another question, you, you mentioned the pressures on young people today, and most of us probably have children, grandchildren. Uh, and what is the best thing that families can do now to be supportive of the young people? You know, it, there are so many things that we can do to support them, but if I had to put it all into one, you know, big word of advice, it's communicate a lot more. Part of the reason why kids are struggling so much is because the distance between the people that could provide safe shelter, emotional support are more and more distant. You know, as kids spend so much more time on social media, they're being influenced by other people, not being influenced by their own family members. Um, life is so fast and so busy and so rapid. You know, the one thing I heard about the pandemic, believe it or not, from my clients is that many parents said to me that they had a secret to tell, which is that they liked being stuck at home with their kids because they actually got to spend time with them, mm -hmm. that they didn't have to drive them all over town, that they didn't have to take them to soccer and this and that and the other. They actually got to spend time together. And so I think it's time, it's communication, and then it's honesty. I feel like whether, you know, and we go back to what Ronald was saying, whether it's our intention to not hurt people, we sometimes keep things from them, but that doesn't give them the chance to learn how to cope, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I always did as a mom was I said to my kids, I'll talk to you about anything. And even if it's hard, even if it's scary, even if it's tough, I'm going to talk to you about it. Because if I don't talk to you about it, then who's going to help you figure out you know what it's all about and um and we, we've had some family challenges with um sick family members and you know unfortunate uh deaths of family members and i always said to my kids i'm going to talk to you about it because if we don't talk about it you don't right. know how to you don't know how to handle it uh, in way, you know yeah. so that's a long answer but it's communication <laughs> honesty <laughs> pulling them a lot closer i think is is key <laughs> So for those of you that know how to use the chat feature, I've put the link in there to um, Buttonwood Books, which um, is selling um, uh, Dangers of an Ordinary Night. And do they have your other books as well? They do. And they also have signed copies of Dangers, which is wonderful. Oh, good. Okay. So like I said, if you want to look in the chat, um, you can copy that link there. And I think Lucille has a question or a comment. Yes. Unmute yourself, Lucille. <laughs> okay. First of all, thank you. You're a fascinating woman. I, I love everything that I'm hearing about you. Amazing. <laughs> Um, if anyone has not read the book, I did. What I want to say is um, I was totally floored at the end. You know, when you're usually reading a book, you know, I, I'm a reader. I love to read. And um, sometimes you have an idea, you know, this is it or that. I was so, so thoroughly stunned at the end. I had no idea what you were up to. So, <laughs> so anyway, um, it was very interesting. Uh, and, and again, I just, because uh, I'm a, uh, I'm from New York and I'm here many years now. I, I love Situate. And another thing I thought about what you had mentioned about your career, um, my husband uh, was an artist, a very good artist, but his mother insisted that he get a career that's a, you know, a very sound career, mm -hmm. something that's gonna give him a living, you know? So um, poor guy, not poor guy, <laughs> he ended up being a clothing designer by trade and believe it or not, when we moved here in Situate, he just fell in love with it. And all his paintings were from here, New England. And, but then his old job came through in New York. Well, you know, he 
commuted 11 years every week, went to New York, and then on the weekend came home and he painted. But that's how much he loves Situate. So mm. I certainly appreciate um, your love for Situate and I love the films that you showed. And uh, but, but anyway, he still continued, you know, with his heart, with his heart's desire with the painting, but that was a sacrifice. Believe me, that was a sacrifice. Yeah. So yes, thank definitely. you. I, I can't wait to read read your past books and the one that's coming up. And I'm oh, definitely I want to be first on that bus when we're going to the Glades. <laughs> yeah, curious. me too. Very curious. Yes, I want to go with all of you. It would be oh, so yeah. fun. It would be really fun. Um, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for the kind word. Um, I love what I do. I know. Uh, I I really feel very fortunate to be able to have the career that I have had and yeah. continue to enjoy while at the same time have my work published because the publishing mm -hmm. landscape is very, very challenging these days. Mm -hmm. And I have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just thrilled that I still get to put these, these, these books that mean a lot to me out into the world. So I'm glad you enjoyed it. That means a lot. Very much so, very much. Very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, for putting this together, by the way. It's yes. Been a night. You're very welcome. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, so just a few things, you know, keep following our Facebook page, check out our beautiful brand new website, situatehistoricalsociety.org. Um, you'll see all the upcoming um, presentations we're having, whether online or in person. And then, like I said, as we get into the summer, probably towards the mid end of summer, there'll be information on the tour. And it'd be great Good. to see you all and bring your books with you and maybe Absolutely. Lynn will sign them for you. <laughs> Can't wait to buy it. Anybody else? Okay, I guess we're all set then. Well, Lynn, thank you so much. It was so great reconnecting with you. And it was, thank you. Thank you. It was great having you here and we can't wait for the new book and hopefully we'll see you on the tour. All right, sounds wonderful. Thank you, wonderful. everyone. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Good night.